Thank you for taking time for Hemp. I'm your host, Casper Leach. You are listening to the live broadcast of Time for Hemp all around the world on AmericanFreedomRadio.com and on AM, FM stations all across America. Those of you who listen to this program often, most likely were sitting at home getting stoned and lip syncing those exact words. I do try to make it a point to be um, on the dime each night and uh, let you know that I am paying attention to your needs and to the hardworking team here at American Freedom Radio. I don't want to let the year end without saying a big thank you to the amazing team at AmericanFreedomRadio.com. Because of them, they have helped us lift the voice of the marijuana movement. They have given me a platform from which to bring a lot of amazing guests and a lot of information to a large audience. And uh, their work is... uh, being uh, successful, I should say, at raising the voice of freedom. And uh, uh, they are a very amazing group of people, and I wanted to make it a point to say thank you to them for the good year that we've had together. And uh, we're looking forward to another fantastic year in 2011. One of the things that I do appreciate about AmericanFreedomRadio.com is the excellent programming that they bring. Not just Time for Hemp, but, excuse me, I have to say, because of my guest, is an excellent show. But they also bring other fantastic programs like the Freedom Files. And if you get a chance to check out James Byrne's program with the Freedom Files, it would behoove you to do so. He's a bright mind and a very good commentator. And uh, I've had the opportunity to work with his dad, Kerry Burns, who has Cannabis Corner on YouTube. And he is tonight's joint host. Kerry, thank you for taking time for hemp. Thank you for having me, Casper. How are you doing? mellow tonight more mellow than i anticipated you sounded a little mellow earlier and uh i also want to remind people that this is leap night l-e-a-p law enforcement against prohibition uh peter chris is on emergency leave he is back in the rear taking care of civilian material he'll be back in the foxhole facing the challenges that come with dealing with this war on drugs when we start next year and carrie i don't know if you're aware but starting monday of next week the third of january time for him is moved to an afternoon time Time slot of noon to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, Monday through Friday. I heard about that. Are you excited about that, Casper? I am very thrilled. It gives me a chance to get a hold of a lot of the East Coast people that I've so missed as having guests on the show. They're normally in bed this time of night, and uh, it will bring uh, a breath of fresh air to the programming for sure. And uh, before we go to commercial break, I want uh, you to tell people how to find your hard work on YouTube. Okay, we can go to uh, the Cannabis Corner on YouTube. Or you can access us through the freedomfiles.us website. We also have the Cannabis Corner link there. And hopefully here in the next week or two, we'll have the uh, cannabiscorner.us website up. So we'll be able to access it through that. There's several outlets, though, but uh, Freedom Files is a good one. Fantastic, it really is. Well, those of you at home, pack a bowl. When we come back from commercial break, it will be leap night here at Time for Hemp. Get your smoke on, be loud, be proud, come out of the closet, let people know that you are a marijuana user, whether it be for medical purposes, because you have glaucoma or you have a, a need for uh, helping you with your chemotherapy or you know, there's a variety of reasons there, whether it's because you just think Jim Carrey is a whole lot more funny when you get high and go watch his silly movies with the kids, or maybe it's to keep you from going down the street and telling the neighbor what a jerk you think the neighbor is. But for whatever reason, 
you should not be a criminal. And as long as it's a criminal, then that means the money is going into the hands of criminals. And the people who are good people are being called criminals and should not be called such. That is what law enforcement against prohibition stands for. We focus primarily on marijuana, but there is a great organization called LEAP at LEAP.cc that focuses on the ending of the prohibition against all drugs. And tonight, representing that remarkable group with my joint host and I, Carrie Burns, is Diane Goldstein, former lieutenant commander of the Redondo Beach Police Department out in California. Diane, thank you for taking time for him. Not a problem. Thank you for having me on board. It's all apologize in advance. I have a horrible sinus infection. So if, I, if I'm having problems being understood, it's because of that. All righty. And I'd like to have you have a chance to meet Carrie Burns, my joint host this evening. Hi, Carrie. Hi. How are you? Hi, Diane. It's a pleasure to meet you. Pleasure right back. Now, you spent 20 years in law enforcement. That means uh, you were right there on the front lines in the war on drugs, arresting people and, and hauling them into jail. And if you first sign a smell of marijuana, you were quick to pull out the handcuffs and all that groovy stuff, right? Well, you know what? Yes and no. I mean, you know, the, the, there's one thing about law enforcement, at least the way that I tried to practice it, was people that deserved to get arrested got arrested. If there, there were times where we were able to use discretion depending on the circumstance. So not necessarily everybody went to jail. Most people did, of course, but uh, uh, not necessarily everybody. So what got you involved in police work to begin with? I mean, that's a pretty noble effort, in my honesty, and I'm sure that when you entered the police department, you went in with the idea of saving little ladies from muggers and, and people from getting their uh, livelihoods stolen by, pe by uh, robbers and thieves, and you found yourself arresting a lot of people doing nonviolent things, but... What got you involved to begin with? You know what it really is about servicing uh, uh, and serving the community. You know, it, it's a, it, at its best level, it can be a very, very noble calling, and you can make a huge impact on people. Um, in the uh, almost 22 years that I spent in law enforcement, probably some of my best assignments were not necessarily the assignments where I was arresting people, but I was having long-term impacts on them by being able to intervene in their life and getting them help that they needed. You know, for example, I started a school resource officer program at uh, uh, Redondo High School. Spent four years there mentoring kids and, and helping all sorts of kids get out of pretty bad situations. And so, you know, the, there, there is those issues where, you know, sometimes you have to police people, but I didn't get into it to police people. I, I got into it because I wanted to be a peace officer, which, which is to serve my community. Right on, right on. And when did it start to change for you? Um, you know what? It, 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 I, I think what happened, it, closer to the end of my career, um, what I saw was that um, law enforcement was losing its ability to use discretion is probably a, a, a good way of explaining it. So, you know, I was able to make less of an impact because the law became the law, and you just had to do what the law said. And it lost a lot of its... Um, uh, it's satisfaction for me at that point. It became more about politics for, you know, uh, district attorneys who wanted high uh, criminal conviction rates and less about doing what was right for the community. All right, now before I pass the question over to Carrie, I'm going to ask this last question. I usually ask this question of most LEAP members, but from listening to what you've already discussed, you joined the police department, you wanted to do good things, and you got involved, and you were doing good things, and then suddenly you realized you weren't happy with the ability uh, to be involved with a discretionary choice, and now you're arresting people for doing something that you don't think is all that bad. I mean, didn't you feel kind of hypocritical there? You know what? I think there are there are times that you can, and I think that's the, the recognition. Sometimes when you need to get out, 
And um, I, what helped me not feel hypocritical was that whenever I enforced the law, I did it with fairness and with compassion. And, and I tried to do it in a circumstance that had good results for everyone at the end. Um, okay. But, but it, it's still, you know, going back, and, and simply from, from a marijuana standpoint, you know, let's just talk marijuana. I think I've always believed that marijuana, you know, going back to the beginning of my career was one of those issues of, you know, if you're in your home and you want to smoke pot and you don't get in a car and you don't drive, you don't hurt someone, then I've never cared. And I never cared as a law enforcement okay. officer. I had enough discretion at times, you know, where, where I could ignore that. But if people are dealing in, you know, pounds of pot and selling the kids, it's a whole different thing. Okay. Does All that right. make Gary, sense? I pass it on to you. It uh, does. I'll, it does. I was just curious, and I'm sure, you know, with every uh, organization, particularly the patrol officers and stuff, I'm sure that there were officers that you knew uh, on the force and stuff that also probably smoked marijuana or, or used it from you know in their own private time and all. Is that true, or did you did you not know any? You know what, I, our police agency was a pretty tight knit law enforcement community. Would it surprise me if there are police officers that are smoking pot? No. Did I know any police officers who were actively smoking pot during the time that I worked? None that, that I knew uh, about. It, but part of the thing that you have to understand is, at least with law enforcement, we are getting drug tested. You know, that, the, that there are some fairly significant consequences if you, in fact, get caught. Oh, okay. So... Oh, yeah. I didn't realize y'all were being under the uh, drug testing rules also. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, it's, and especially is, you know, for example, you know, if, if you get involved in a on-duty traffic collision, you know, if there's any hint or any potential smell on you, you're going to have to go in and give a blood test. You know, as well. So, you know, it really, you know, it depends on the circumstances, depends on the agency, depends on, you know, the police department in the state. But if you had, say, personally known something and all, it's like your comments were that you, if people were at home smoking and all, you probably wouldn't use that against the officer. I mean, you'd pretty much say that was his, pretty much his own business and all, wouldn't you think? Or, you, know, um, you would make, make an effort to try to get him arrested or anything. No, 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 no. But, but, but I think that the, that the line that, uh, you know, gets crossed, I'll be quite frank with you in this, this aspect, is if he's doing something that where he comes to work and he's endangering the safety of the community or, you know, his partners, that's a whole other different animal. And, and I think you have to, to look at it based on a, uh, on a case-by-case basis. But the other issue is I would find that it, it incredibly hypocritical that you would have a police officer who is out there smoking dope and going out and actively arresting people. I, th I think that's a line I would never be able to cross, and I would hope that there are other officers out there that would hold themselves to a much higher standard. Right. Police I mean, officers that's, true. <laughs> that's true, and one of the things that I think also helped open your mind was the fact that your older brother... Uh, was suddenly involved with a variety of well, illegal Well, you know what, my, my, older, it, my older brother started smoking pot when he was 13, and if we look at his life, you know, he, he died uh, fairly early from a heart attack that in large part was probably caused by a combination of, of illicit drug use and psychotropic medications, not pot, okay, but, um, you know, there were, there were times where he was a heavy meth user and, and um, used other drugs as well. And, but what I saw in his journey, because my brother and I had always been very close going back to when he was 13. There was only, you know, less than a, a year and a half age difference with us. Is as I saw him through this journey, both growing up, going through law enforcement, getting out of law enforcement, what I saw is that, you know, he would maintain significant amount of time of sobriety. But when he fell... There was never resources available to help him get through it. And, and, and there were times where it was just a matter of, he's going to die, I just don't know when. 
or he's going to go to state prison, and I just don't know when. And if that happens, you know, here's a person who would have gone to state prison really for being a simple drug user um, because he had started out, you know, he got caught with misdemeanor and, um, you know, then got caught again then became a felony, and then the next time around, you know, he would have ended up going to state prison, and that would have changed him tremendously too. So we don't have enough resources to treat people. I, I, I believe that, that being a drug abuser should be a public health policy issue and not a criminal issue unless you're going out and committing a crime against other people. Exactly. Now, I recognize in your uh, bio that you were involved with gang intervention and dealing on the front lines. So you recognize how keeping all these drugs illegal underwrites the cost of that 16-year-old getting three, three, three uh, weapons to uh, pop off at the police and uh, how it is that uh, because they're underage and they're juveniles, you haul them into jail and uh, three minutes after you've left the sidewalk with them, there's another 17-year-old kid there to take their place. Absolutely. There, there, is, there is no doubt that what, I, what I've seen, the, ev the evolution of law enforcement, is that what we're doing is we're throwing money at a problem that's based on huge and obscene profits. And, you know, I just had a son that graduated from high school, and I, what I can tell you is that, you know, pot was always easier for him and any of his friends to buy on any high school campus. You know, drug dealers don't ask for ID, it's not regulated, and you know, the, the whole arguments which, which just drive me crazy with that gateway drug thing is, you know, you, you know what, just because you smoke pot doesn't mean you're going to become a drug addict, but what happens is, is that drug dealer has stuff other than marijuana. And, and so your, your, chi your kid may you know, try something else simply because one day he shows up and, and the drug dealer doesn't have pop, but he has, you know, a, a, an eight ball of methamphetamine or cocaine or LSD or something else. Now, i got to ask you this question just because it happens to come up in conversation. And, Carrie, I don't mean to step on your time. No, go but, ahead, Carrie. Uh, you, you, you said you have a son now. He's off, off to college campus now. It's expensive to go to college. I mean, it really does cost a lot of money. Yes, and it does. And to be honest, if your son was... If your son was to roll in 10 or 15 pounds of marijuana a month into his university and just sell it for a, a little bit of profit, he could help offset the cost of his college education uh, a lot easier than working at a McDonald's or working through the student exchange programs that they have there. Now, and, a lot, and a lot of kids do that. I, I mean, I, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm not stupid enough or naive enough to, to not think that, that there are college kids who are not doing that in order to pay for their school. Oh, I wasn't saying that you were. I'm just saying that that's just a horrible scenario. It, it is. No, it is. It, it, make up. No, you, you know what? No, no I wasn't. I, 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 didn't, I hope I didn't come across as, as condescending. I was just trying to make a statement that a fact is horrible that uh, he can go across state lines and spend 25 minutes picking up three pounds and come back and spend, I don't know, 20 hours total the month and cover more money than if you worked 40 hours a week at a McDonald's at an honest job. No, I, I, com I completely agree with you on that. Completely. You know, and, and there's, and you know what, and there's, and there's no doubt. I, you know what, I will bet you, across our college campuses, there are tons of kids that are doing that already. The problem is, is the cost can become very high for them because, you know, when it, it's the risk. It's the issues of risk now. And I, th and I think that... Part, part of my whole issue with, with pot now, it, it really is much more than just a user issue. It's we are dramatically changing our young kids' lives. You know, when I was in high school, you know, the cops would stop you. If you had a joint, you had a beer, they dump it out, they kick your ass, they send you home, or they bring you home, okay? The, right. Right. Now, the same behavior whether it's a joint or whether it's a beer, costs our children so much more because there's no discretion anymore. And so, you know, that, that experimentation which all kids go through, okay, it right. comes at a much higher cost to them potentially. 
But I hope they recognize it because they can end up, if they're not careful, throwing their entire future away on a few pounds of pot if no. they're in the wrong state, doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. No, absolutely. But it, it, it was really, tr it's amazing, too. And that is really underwriting the cost of so much other activities from the border of Mexico to, uh, uh, I guess we were talking about, to the classrooms in America today. Yeah, well, you know what? I have this real, real belief that we don't have a illegal immigration issue. We have a drug cartel issue that's incredibly violent. And what most of our politicians are unwilling to do, and you guys are in Texas, you know, we're in Southern California, uh, you know, we've got friends uh, in, in Arizona. What the issue is, it's a drug cartel violence issue down there. And it's not a illegal immigration issue. And, and, and we're picking the wrong battle to fight. Yeah, and and right. you're always going to have some type of black market. You're never going to be able to completely eliminate the black market, and LEAP doesn't ever say that. You know, if you completely legalized all drugs today, there would still be a black market in some aspect, mm -hmm. but it would be a lot less, and, it, and you would see no different than prohibition. You'd see a tremendous amount of the problems go away. Well, one of the problems Absolutely. I see... Absolutely. Diane, one of the problems I see, though, with the current with the like the medical marijuana and then the growers in california and stuff is everybody's still operating at this uh at this illicit level and the Correct. price reflects this illicit level and once we legalize cannabis and bring this into mainstream and mainstream industry really it's the hemp industry and the taxes and, and revenues from the products and stuff that's going to generate the money not the smoking marijuana that that you can almost give it away by comparison well, to the cost it, I need to jump in here right now. We're talking about money, and it's a good time because we're going to pay our bills here with a commercial break. And then we're going to listen to a groovy song. And after that, we'll come back and pick up where we left off here at Time for Hemp. We've been jamming out to Los Marijuanos with Pony Boy doing lead here on Time for Hemp. We are on AmericanFreedomRadio.com and on AM, FM stations all across America. So a reminder, starting January 3rd, Time for Hemp Live will be heard Monday through Friday, noon to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Please make it a point to uh, note the difference in, in time slots so that you don't sit down with your bowl all packed, ready to fire up at midnight, and we're not there. So, with that said, uh, my joint host tonight, uh, Carrie Burns, and I are having an interesting conversation with a member of LEAP, L-E-A-P, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, Diane Goldstein. Diane, I did not mean to interrupt the conversation you and Carrie were having, but we had to pay our bills. So not I'll a problem, Mike. I understand that. Where were we, uh, Carrie? Well, what I was saying was all the... Uh, like all of the regulations and everything that's going with the growers to produce the medical marijuana. And besides, you know, my, my issue is it's not just the medical marijuana people that need cannabis, but, and we've been trying for 40 years just to get it so we can use it, you know, without any law enforcement bothering us or anything like that. But all of these revenues and tax revenues and, and all these regulations and stuff, all, they're basing all that on this illicit market, this, you know, $20 grand price uh, for these various types of cannabis and stuff that are available. And what I'm saying is once you, once you have a legal market and all, that, that figure is going to fall off the map. I mean, it's going to go back down to, you know, pre-70 prices before the cartels actually existed when it was just a mom-and-pop operation bringing canvas in and the few people that were growing you know in the united states before that movement really got going strong but uh don't can't you see that the the cartels really and like you said we don't have the immigration problem you're right if you look at the the these shows like the border wars and stuff their their border wars ought to be renamed marijuana wars because sure. basically all they're doing is stopping these people that are bringing the cannabis over. And if you if you didn't have that tremendous amount of money for these people to be making like it was back in the 70s, early, late 60s and early 70s, you wouldn't have the cartels, nor would you have cops having to chase after these people. So. It's about the money. You know, people keep focusing on the drugs. It's not about the drugs. It's about the money. And, and you know, and, and there's things that, that I think that in California, specifically in California, law enforcement had, had always been very, very proud of 
the ability of California cops to be, as I jokingly refer to it, as you know, corrupt free, pure as the driven snow. And what you <laughs> and what you've uh-huh. seen is in the last, you know, since the '80s, you know, you have seen corruption start creeping in into California law enforcement that you never would have thought you would have seen. You know, and and, and I was and I was a young police officer in the early '80s. Uh, late eighties when cocaine was king and, and I can tell you we were we were um, taking uh, money from cocaine dealers who basically you know the, the money drives separately than the dope, and you know we were seizing one hundred and fifty two hundred and fifty million dollars without batting an eye and and what happens is you start seeing all that money and and Someone eventually says, look, they're not paying me enough for this. So what happens if I take, you know, 5000 10000 You know, and, and I, there was one time in my law enforcement career, I'm sitting there with a million dollars cash in front of me, cash. You know, we, we, we hit a, a dope house, found, found the million dollars cash, beautiful neighborhood. The only thing that was in the house was a refrigerator and, and a mattress on the floor and a TV and a million dollars. And there was a group of us, and we're all kind of looking at this million dollars cash going, wow. And I just kind of looked and said, are you kidding? I am not going to go to jail for anything less. You know, kind of in that joking and, 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 you know, I put the joke out there, which was I'm not going to jail for anything less than $10 billion, and, you know, I'm going to go buy my own island and change my face. But it dawned on everyone. I mean, everybody kind of looked at each other at one time, and these are guys that I worked with that would never do anything, would never, and, and we all joked about it. And, and, but still, and, each of you had your, like your kid could use uh, better clothes or help the school, and somebody had medical bills to cover. And you I'm got sure a kid who's got cancer, you know, whatever it happens nice to be. Of you, yeah, it's, if each of you could have just gotten like $15,000 and quietly walked out the door and went, oh, it was a domestic dispute and it's settled now. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, you know what, but, but nobody, no one was willing to risk that little amount of money to go to state prison, you know, and, and, and cool. there's, there's that whole ethical standard, but we all joked about it because nobody there, nobody there had ever seen that much money ever before. I wonder how many no. that took money that you didn't know about or were later prosecuted for you, you, you know what? I, I don't know. I mean, you know, back in the 80s, uh, there was a, uh, the local sheriff's department, L.A. County, had a, a crew that we used to do work with that was a narcotics crew. And they actually got caught stealing money. But what they were stealing money from, from dope dealers from, not for their own personal gain, they were taking money to put into a pot to help them do their job better. I, I can remember uh, back when I was wow. young, and uh, th- they had confiscated an airplane at one of the local airports, and it had like 1,200 pounds of Mexican marijuana on it. Yeah. And uh, right before that happened, it, it was kind of a dry period. You know, you couldn't find anything on the streets. I mean, there just absolutely wasn't anything around. And, I mean, the day they busted that, there were literally police officers coming to the parks where everybody hung out, and they had bags of weed for sale for $6 an ounce, and they were selling them right out of the paddy wagons. Wow. I don't know what if these were just individual cops that had a little business going on the side, because back then it really wasn't that big of a deal yeah. uh, you know, for people to use weed and stuff like it is today for some reason. Oh, yeah. And the, and the cops even then, I mean, you could walk down the street smoking a joint, and they really wouldn't hassle you. It wasn't really that big of a deal. You know, they didn't really look at you like a criminal like they do today. And uh, But I... You know, I feel like that there was a lot of that going on, and and people just didn't really think that that was going on because it was law enforcement. Yeah, yeah and you know what? And like everything else, is you know what is law enforcement takes people who are from the human race, and we all have our our foibles, and you know some of us are good people and have those ethics, and law enforcement hires bad people, and you know there are cops that shouldn't be cops, just like there are judges and doctors and. You know, attorneys that shouldn't be out there helping people. 
You know. so, now, what I don't understand is the collective minds of Congress and the Senate who should be able to realize that these insane laws, these failed policies, are yeah. actually paying for the bullets that uh, al-Qaeda is using on our U.S. military. Absolutely. That the, our, the cartels are using on our uh, border patrol along the Mexican border with Texas and Arizona. And in the streets of L.A., the gangbangers are using on the police departments and all the cities across America. They surely got to be smart enough to know that if they stopped this insane war, uh, the other side would go broke almost overnight. You, you know what? I think you're finally starting to see... Not people necessarily come around, but I think there's going to be an, a more open and frank discussion. And there's, I think, a couple things that contributed to that. Our politicians are not necessarily one of them, but um, the economy. What has happened to the United States in, in the last couple years from, from an economic viewpoint is now forcing people that you never would have considered would ever publicly come out and say, this is a failed policy. We're throwing, you know, good money out after bad money. And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because here in California, um, I, was, I was very disappointed uh, with both sides of the House, so to speak. I'm a libertarian, okay? I, I'm an independent. I vote across party lines. But, but what what been interesting to me in this last election, what Prop 19 did is you heard some very uh, conservative voices who are finally coming out and saying, we have to rethink this. You know, people that, that none of us may possibly agree with, but are at least have the courage to say it. I mean, Glenn Beck, you know, Sarah Palin, who I would never vote for, but you know what? She said it. You know, it, it Yep. That there, William Buckley has been preaching this for the last 20 years. You know, you got John Stossel out there. But, you know, Republican, I mean, come on, Texas, Dr. Ron Paul and his son, Rand Paul. You know, right. and, and I think finally what you're even, going I, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but even Pat Robertson. Pat Robertson, week, so. yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. And yet, in California, the face of the Democratic Party Barbara Boxer, Kamala Harris, Jerry Brand, Diane Feinstein, every single Democrat came out very vocally against uh, Prop 19. And part of the issues, this is my personal opinion, okay, this, this is just me, is that the Democrats don't want to appear soft on crime. And because they have the public safety union backing, which they're incredibly proud of, they're unwilling to challenge law enforcement and say, look, the results aren't working. California still has civil commitments for drug users in our prisons. It's absurd. We spend in California $44,688 per year per inmate, about roughly 20, 25% of our inmates in California are in for just simple drug offenses. We're talking millions and millions of dollars that could be better spent going towards education, you know, front-loading the system versus back-loading the system, treatment. I mean, treatment has been shown to have been more effective than incarceration, going back to the 90s by the Rand Corporation exactly. study. Exactly. Now, i got to jump in here because we're going to go to commercial break, but uh, before we get there, you're just focusing on the, on the cost of incarceration. We haven't even talked about how much it costs to get into the jails, to get them arrested, to get them through the, the courthouse, to get them in front of the judge, and... If we took them from uh, being a burden on our society and left them as a tax-paying member of our society, Correct. not only would they stop draining, they would be adding to the coffer. And with that said, we're going to add to our coffer so that we can stay on the air, and you can tell your friends that it really is time for hemp. Freedom Files, Freedom Files. weekday, Files. Monday through Friday from 3 to 5 p.m. Central on American Freedom Radio. Freedom Radio. I'm kinda high, let me excuse myself But it seems like it's just moments since we met 
I'm kind of high. Let me introduce myself. Yeah, baby, let me introduce myself. My name, Casper Leach, the name of the program you are listening to, Time for Hemp, where? On AmericanFreedomRadio.com and on AM, FM stations all across America. I want to give a big shout out to KDK Distributors for giving us an amazing grant and keeping us strong here. Without their assistance, we would nowhere be as loud and proud as we are here on AmericanFreedomRadio.com. And I also want to send my feelings of friendship and understanding to my dear friend, Peter Chris, and uh, let you know, Peter, we're thinking about you this evening, you and your family, and uh, you are in our prayers. And uh, tonight on our program, it's Leap Night, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Go to leap.cc and find out how amazing they are. My joint host, Kerry Burns, and I are being joined by Diane Goldstein, who is a former lieutenant commander on the Redondo Beach Police Department there in California. And Diane, I know it's no surprise to you when I tell you this because, you know, I've had Mark Emery on and I've had, you know, the founders of High Times and Normal and, you know, people like you on. At the DEA, I'm sure, listens in at least to the radio show, if not to every single one of my phone calls. <laughs> so with that said, we got, we got people who are being paid to listen to you and Carrie and I tonight, and uh, I hope when they do listen, they take notes and go and talk to Eric Holder. And, but with that said, uh, if you could say something too directly to the DEA, Diane, what would that be? Well, I, I think what I would what I would say is that we have to rethink our drug war policy. It's a failure. Um, you know, I, I was a little irritated this year. That part of the Obama stimulus package, $2 billion went to law enforcement, including the DEA, which I'm not certain anyone even knew that it was earmarked in there. Why, why do we need to, you know, give stimulus money to law enforcement instead of to the small business community who's creating no jobs kidding. and the economy in our, depart- in, in, in our country? And, How and much was that? It was something like two two billion. I mean, I, I can't remember the exact amount. I mean, it was yeah. and and how I found it is Barbara Boxer was quite proud of of that uh, in you know part of her reelection campaign that she helped sign this. And when you went down and took a look at it, you went, wait a minute, this is stimulus money. This money was supposed to have gone out to create jobs, not to arrest people. No kidding. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I'm kind of at this point, I have a pox to both houses, it is that, you know, I believe that money spent on the DEA would be better spent on true border control and immigration if we're going to use it appropriately. Um, I, you know, I believe that all the billions of dollars, I mean, what is it now? We're at $2.5 trillion in the last 40 years. Do any of us feel any safer? No. It's it's so, you know, my husband and I own some businesses. If that was our businesses, we'd be bankrupt. We'd be done. And, it, no it, kidding. And, wow. and, and so maybe it's now time to say, look, you know, maybe we're not going to completely legalize all drugs, but it's time to decriminalize minimally and start treatment. You know, and I think absolutely because that one billion dollars going into a true stimulus program could have put a, an awful lot of people to work and could have really moved this country forward like that was supposed to. Exactly. Uh, oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, so so there's you know so those are the things I think that our country is not focusing on, and our politicians are more focused on getting reelected than doing what's right for our communities. Okay, now we're down to a couple of minutes. So, Kara, I'll let you ask one last question. Well, I just, what I, I was just going to further iterate, the, the powers in this country that control the alcohol, tobacco, and the prescription drug industries are the chief funders for these partnerships on Drug Free America. And those drugs kill 
you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of times more than any illicit drugs. And the fact that cannabis doesn't kill any, you know, it, it just sort of makes you think, wait a minute, there are powers that be that are keeping this illegal for a specific reason. And it was, and then, you know, we're, it's just like, you know, Leap and all, and organizations like Time for Hand, Cannabis Court, all those, we're all doing our part. But it just seems like there's this omnipresent power that's just impenetrable, you know. Yep. Yep, and we didn't even get a chance to talk about legal hemp products and what that would do for our country. Not, it's a not trillion dollar industry. Exactly. Well, it, I'll tell you what, Diane. Uh, why don't we have you back on the program sometime next month? I, I would love to. Our, when we go to our new time slot, which again will be from noon to one p.m. Central Standard Time. Now, uh, Diane, I'll let you go ahead and give a shout out for Leap. Uh, anyone who's interested in joining LEAP, please, uh, it's not just law enforcement and judges and prosecutors that belong. We have a tremendous amount of uh, community members uh, who believe in our message. Um, so uh, please visit the LEAP, the Law Enforcement Against Prohibition website, and uh, any uh, amount of money that you can send us would be greatly appreciated. Amen. And Carrie, give a shout out for your YouTube site. Uh, Cannabis Corner, and then go to freedomfiles.us, and pretty soon, CannabisCorner.com. And again, go to, go, go to leap.cc, find a speaker for your neck of the woods. Tomorrow night will be our New Year's Eve party. Uh, Friday will be a rerun, so everybody can enjoy the holidays. So it's going to be family night tomorrow night, and we're going to be celebrating with some very good music and kush. So tell your friends to join in and take time for him.